Hey, what is up guys, I'm KBHD here, and we all have goals, right? Hashtag goals, but uh, smartphones also have goals, or at least we have smartphone goals. We see all these crazy concept renders of the iPhone 8, and they look ridiculous, obviously, but in the coming months, they're gonna be more and more popular, and like clockwork in August and September this year, it will be peak iPhone rumor hype train season, and these videos will be the ones that are shared the most. But I think everyone kinda knows, or at least most people know, that that's not actually the next iPhone, but we are taking steps to get closer to that reality. So for proof, these are five super distant future smartphone features, and their roots in today's products. So number one is the bezel-less display concept. I mean, look at this. Just look, I mean, this is the dream for some people, right? Now you might think about it for an extra second or two and realize, wait a second, there's no place for my fingers, like there might be accidental screen presses, or where did the webcam go, where's the speakers now? But just ignore all that for a second and just look at it. This, at its core, is an awesome concept. It looks cool, you can't help but stare at it. Videos would look awesome on the screen, taking pictures would look crazy, like it, it just looks like the future. Now Samsung knows that, and they made this, the Galaxy S7 Edge last year. Not only does the display and the glass wrap around right up to the edge of the phone, but they dropped in some actually pretty useful edge display features too. So the whole UI really melts over the edges, looks pretty futuristic, Plus obviously videos and photos look cool too. And Samsung also made the Galaxy Note 7 this way, but we all know how that ended up. But I'd expect more of that whole edge display stuff in the Galaxy Note 8 and the Galaxy S8. And then you all saw the video of the Xiaomi Mi Mix, which pushes the bezel-less display concept a little further, right up to the point where it pushed the webcam and the earpiece speaker right off the top of the phone. Now the webcam actually returned down at the bottom, which is a little awkward, but not the worst thing in the world since you can turn the phone upside down. But the earpiece speaker didn't return. Instead, they built in what's called a piezoelectric speaker, which vibrates the glass on the front of the phone itself to produce sound that you hear when you put it up to your ear. And it actually works pretty well. All of that to achieve a display that just goes right up to the edge of the device. Worth it. So bottom line, edge-to-edge -edge glass is a thing. It might not be exactly like the concept, but it still looks really cool in real life. Overall, I give the feasibility of this concept an eight out of 10. So number two is the future of wireless charging. So we always want our phones to be charged up, right? And wires are fine and they work and everything, but a bunch of phones now have wireless charging where you can place your compatible phone on a compatible little pad without any wires and your phone is charging. I mean, technically there's still a wire connecting it to the wall, but technically there's no wires connected to your phone, so we'll, we'll call it wireless charging. But you still have to have your phone in like one exact little spot to charge, and you can't even really pick it up and use it without it stopping the charge, so it's almost less convenient than wired charging. The dream is just to be able to walk into a room with your phone, and it's wirelessly charging, just like that. You don't even have to worry about it. But that's a long way off. What we do have in development today is somewhere in between long range wireless charging is what it's called. And I don't think we'll ever safely get to that whole full on walk into a room and start charging goal, but various companies are working on long range wireless charging with stuff like lasers, with ultrasound even, and with radio frequency. So there's a bunch of ways to do this whole wireless charging thing from a couple inches to a couple feet away. The biggest challenge with this one is definitely compatibility though. Even now we have a bunch of different wireless charging standards among smartphones, but I think a pretty good bet is whichever Apple chooses for their next wireless charging iPhone, the first one that they do, will have a pretty big impact on the future. Like I've said, one of the reasons Apple got rid of the headphone jack on the iPhone 7 is that's another step marching towards their eventual goal of a completely portless, completely wireless iPhone somewhere down the line. And in order to get to that, they eventually have to remove that last port which is a charging port. And in order to do that, you need wireless charging. Overall, I'm giving this concept a seven out of 10. So number three is voice control of all the things. And I really like this one. I actually think voice control is pretty good as it already is, and it's useful for a lot of people. But I think the goal, the real goal, is to have this sort of closest as possible to a all-knowing human-like personal assistant. Have you ever listened to Logic's The Incredible True Story where they're just on the spaceship and he's asking the computer a bunch of random facts and things to do and it knows how to do everything, even how to make jokes? Yeah, man, they didn't just upgrade features, they enhanced her AI. So she can actually hold a conversation? Yeah, ask her yourself. Uh, what am I thinking, Thalia? Kai, I'm a program in the ship's interface, not a psychic. Damn, girl. Yeah, that's another thing now. That, I think that right there is the ideal voice assistant in its most helpful form. So with enough computing power and a complete enough knowledge graph, you can actually do almost all of that. Maybe not the making jokes part, but that's kind of a bonus. But the hardest part of what the computer actually did in that album was listening to two different people 
recognizing them, and then responding to each of them differently based on what it knows about each person. That is the hard part. It's the same thing that happens with the computer in Star Trek. Our phones today are supposed to be able to recognize your voice and respond to you and not others. Yet for most people, I can just sit right here in this chair and go, okay, Google, hey, Siri. And like half of you probably just had your phone go off. Not even sorry. So even with enough training, voice recognition between multiple people as the only difference is really, really hard. Not to mention it's super easy to fake someone's voice by not just sounding like them, but with a recording. So half of this goal is kind of realistic and half seems really far off. I'll give it like a five out of 10. Now number four is, this one's crazy, flexible smartphones. Every single flexible smartphone demo I've seen looks crazy in some way. The goal is to have a completely flexible smartphone. You can just wrap around anything, shape it whatever you want, fold it, put it in your pocket. I don't know, wrap it around your wrist. There's all kinds of things you could do with a flexible smartphone. But I don't think this one happens anytime soon for a bunch of reasons. Why? Number one, in order to have a flexible smartphone, you don't just need a flexible display, you need every single component inside the smartphone to be flexible too. And we have flexible displays, as you've probably already seen, but you'll notice that every single one of those is connected to some sort of brick at the bottom or the end. A brick that holds, you know, the rest of the smartphone. The processor, the RAM, the storage, the battery, none of which are flexible at all. But two, even when you just think about something folding in half, you have two surfaces, and that means the surface on the inside where it folds needs to be able to compress, and the surface on the outside needs to be able to stretch. And if you fold both ways, both sides need to be able to do both. All of that makes a very malleable material, which means it's not very durable. It's just not a good recipe for building a smartphone out of. So that's why pretty much every flexible smartphone demo is really just a flexible display demo. Now Lenovo did make a flexible smartphone concept last year, like a fully flexible phone in one direction. And it kind of had its internal components spread out and laid out just perfectly so that you could fold it along certain predetermined lines. But obviously that's a lot uglier and a lot less useful than the goals we had in mind. Plus I'm not even sure a flexible smartphone is what we really want anyway. So overall I give this one about a four out of 10. So number five, last but definitely not least is a battery technology breakthrough. And I know this is the second one about batteries since we had wireless charging, but hey, batteries are kind of a pain point with smartphones. And this one's more of a long shot than any, uh, but graphene batteries. We can work with lithium technology all we want and it'll keep getting better as it does. We get little density increases, we get better layouts, charging gets a little bit faster, new designs like stacked battery cells are awesome. But at the end of the day, they're powering more and more powerful devices and through years and years and years of development, our smartphones still last one day, if we're lucky. So there's always articles and talks about some breakthrough battery technology that might not be lithium based at all, not lithium ion, not lithium polymer, just completely new. Graphene is one of the most promising materials out there. If you haven't heard of it, it's definitely worth reading up on. It's essentially just a sheet of pure carbon atoms that's just one atom thick. So basically a 2D material in this form. It's completely transparent when it's this thin. It has a ridiculous strength to weight ratio, light as air, but literally harder than diamond. And it's one of the most electrically conductive materials too, even more than copper that we already use everywhere. So people wanna use graphene to make all kinds of stuff in all kinds of different industries. If we could make smartphone batteries out of this kind of thing or car batteries or any battery, we could get almost superconductor like performance and possibly have charging up in seconds while the charge lasts for weeks. I mean, that's the goal. So the reason we're not going to see it super soon is the manufacturing prowess to make this stuff is not there, like at all. The first way humans ever found graphene was by taking some scotch tape, taking some graphite off a pencil, and just peeling it apart over and over again to get thinner and thinner slices until some flakes happened to be that sheet of one atom thick graphene. But that's not even producing graphene, that's just stripping carbon sheets from the end of a pencil tip. The most efficient manufacturing processes today can make a sheet of graphene that's maybe the size of a playing card or an index card, for a little under a thousand dollars, but that's still very little material because it's only one atom thick. As you can imagine, it's very, very hard to manufacture materials that are one atom thick. Overall, I give this for feasibility about a two out of 10. So there you have it, stuff from the future versus stuff we have now. Maybe let me know which one you're most excited for. Personally, I'm all on board with the super thin side bezels. I'll still take the top and bottom bezel. I like front facing speakers, I don't mind those. But uh, give me those, those melting over glass sides. I'm kind of a big fan of that. Either way, that's been it. Thank you for watching. Feel free to share this video and I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Peace.